The shocking events in Christchurch on February the 22nd, 2011, are a powerful reminder of just how dangerous it is to live on a plate boundary. New Zealand is one of the most seismically active countries on Earth. It's riddled with faults from East Otago through to Auckland. For years, scientists have been expecting a big earthquake from the Southern Alps from the Alpine Fault. The Alpine Fault rupture will be a big earthquake. It's one of the really big faults of the world. It's on a par with the San Andreas Fault in California or the big fault that goes through Turkey. These big faults mark the boundaries where the tectonic plates meet each other in constant movement around the surface of the globe. In some places, the plates are being pulled away from one another. In some places, the plates are being smashed into one another. And in some places, the plates are sliding along side by side. And none of this behavior is smooth. It was the collision of two plates that pushed up the Southern Alps, and they're still growing. The fastest rising mountains in the world, and the backbone of the Alpine Fault. Big enough to be seen from space, the size of the fault dictates how big an earthquake it can produce. Beginning at the Milford Sound, the Alpine Fault reveals itself as a scar running almost the length of the South Island. It's capable of generating a magnitude 8.2 or 8.3 earthquake, with its last one back in 1717 and a return period of one to 400 years, the next one could happen at any time. which is why seismic engineers from Canterbury University designed the technology needed to capture the earthquake in action and installed hundreds of seismic recording devices all over the Canterbury Plains. So that's an amazing opportunity because if you can surround your earthquake source with your instruments, you have so much better control of all sorts of details. And early in the morning on September the 4th, 2010, that technology instead recorded every single detail of an earthquake from a completely different set of faults. Holy shit. Tonight on Prime News, disaster in the Garden City. A state of emergency declared as Christchurch is rocked by a 7.1 magnitude earthquake. Disaster struck at 4.35 this morning, 30 kilometres west of the Garden City. The quake was felt across much of the country. The earthquake caused major damage to the central business district and to the city's infrastructure. The cost of repair was estimated to be at least $2 billion. But miraculously, no one was killed. So it's not the magnitude of the earthquake that is the sole factor that determines how damaging it is and how many fatalities might occur. There have been magnitude eight earthquakes, for instance, that have not killed anyone in remote areas. There was nothing remote about this earthquake, but thanks to the lack of fatalities, this was a great earthquake from at least one perspective. The Darfield earthquake in September was a scientist's dream in the sense that it created a beautiful surface rupture it occurred in an area where we had a dense network of seismometers, but for the most part, it was almost guilt-free science because we could go out and we could spend, you know, hours and hours out there doing science without having that burden knowing that there had been a loss of life associated with that scientific phenomenon. That scientific phenomenon begins in the convoluted and deformed grey wacky rock, which is the backbone of New Zealand. Its seemingly solid mass was soaking up some powerful forces beneath the surface of the Canterbury Plains. So we tend to think of rocks as being very brittle things, and in fact they are. It's that 
breaking, that brittle breaking of rocks that causes earthquakes. They can also bend. And it's that bending of rock that we call the accumulation of elastic strain through time over thousands and millions of years. It's the relentless jostling for position of the tectonic plates around the Earth that puts enormous strain on the rock beneath her surface. So as the Pacific and the Australian plates move relative to one another, the intervening rock mass bends and bends and bends until eventually they break in an earthquake. The September earthquake began 40 kilometers west of Christchurch City, near Darfield, beside the Charing Cross intersection. So we're standing here at the epicenter of the Darfield earthquake, which is the point on the Earth's surface directly above where that earthquake actually began, some 10 and a half kilometers beneath our feet. Below the layers of gravel and rock, in the heart of a 20 kilometer slab of gray wacky, the rock broke. We often think of faults as a line on a map. It makes it easy for us to visualize them. But in fact, there are a whole series of planes, of fractures in different orientations. And when an earthquake starts, it may start as a small rupture patch on one of those faults, which then grows at several kilometers a second and jumps from one crack to another crack to another crack in different orientations. That fault broke in both ways, both towards the north and towards the south. And where it broke towards the south, it eventually, within eight to 10 seconds, intersected the Greendale Fault. Once it did that, almost instantaneously, the Greendale Fault ruptured both in an easterly fashion towards Christchurch and in a northwesterly fashion towards the Southern Alps from this site. To the northwest, it broke open a shallow fault near Hororata but most of its seismic energy went east, speeding straight towards Christchurch as the initial break spread through a network of faults. The seismic waves from the Darfield earthquake actually migrated out through the crust and jiggled the crust around a little bit and caused the stresses to increase in some areas and decrease in other areas. And in this particular area, uh, there was a significant number of aftershocks throughout all to the east of where the Greendale Fault ended. With Christchurch lying directly to the east, one of those aftershocks was to have deadly consequences. It was six months since the 7.1 Darfield earthquake rocked the city of Christchurch. And despite the 7,000 aftershocks, no one really expected another big one. We knew that this whole area was under stress. What we didn't know was where the potential faults were in this area and how big they might be. But the previously unknown Port Hills Fault was about to show what it was capable of. The magnitude 6.3 February earthquake started approximately five kilometers right below my feet, right in this area of Southern Christchurch. At that point, two faults, a reverse fault and a strike sub fault, intersected. The reverse fault caused this area to move up some 40 centimeters. And the strike slip fault, where rocks were sliding side to side, actually moved about two to three meters at depth. There was a third fault further to the east, which also moved. It was a rupture of all these faults within seconds that caused that, that tremendous amount of energy to be released into the Christchurch area. As the rock ruptures, it releases thousands of years of stored energy in an instant. It travels as seismic waves that should get smaller as the energy moves through the Earth. But Christchurch was virtually on top of the rupture point, and the rock was still splitting. So the fault was growing, and the seismic waves were piling up at around the same speed. And it was like a sonic boom, these seismic waves and this rupture energy kind of arriving in the city at around the same time. 
Yes, yes. Oh my God. Liquefaction brought tons of silt to the city streets. Cliffs gave way, rock fell, and buildings failed. 185 people died, and more than 4,000 were injured in this unusually violent event. Scientists were seeking explanations for why it was so destructive. And one of the key attributes of that earthquake was these tremendous ground accelerations, not just in the horizontal sense, but in the vertical sense. In the city, they were up to 1.8 G. So uh, there was tremendous amount of vertical accelerations and a lot of damage because of that. Most of the deaths were caused by just two collapsed buildings. The CTV building was built in 1986, the Pine Gould Corporation building in 1966, and neither of them would meet 100% of today's building code, a code designed primarily to save lives, even if the building is damaged beyond repair. 41 more people were killed by older buildings collapsing, those built with unreinforced masonry. Despite the tragic loss of life, the experts tell us the building stock performed remarkably well. If you think about this building stock in New Zealand, uh, there's ba basically a, almost a whole variety of modern kind. We don't have uh, those ancient 2,000, 3,000 years old building. The new building stock built since 1930 obviously is better than what was built uh, before, in general sense, because we don't have unreinforced masonry building new, but every 10 years, the building stock was improving the technology, the safety behind it, because the knowledge in earthquake engineering was improving. In the summer of 2011, Christchurch had 212 hotel, apartment, and office buildings of five stories or more. The tallest was the Pricewaterhouse Cooper building, 22 stories high, built of concrete reinforced with steel, the top of the PWC building would have swayed a meter or more during the February earthquake. The higher the 1,200 people inside it were, the more shaking they experienced. Oh, it was a big earthquake. Oh, shit. Like hundreds of other multi-story buildings in the CBD, the Pricewaterhouse Cooper building behaved exactly as it was designed to do, thanks to a seismic design philosophy developed only 15 kilometers from where the earthquake struck. In the 1960-1970, uh, University of Canterbury really introduced in the worldwide community a breakthrough in earthquake engineering, which was called capacity design. Let's get, first of all, uh, the beam, 2.5. Capacity design revolutionized the construction of seismically safe buildings throughout the world. The old way of trying to get uh, through an earthquake uh, was to be as strong as possible and stronger possibly than the earthquake itself. There is a wiser way. The wiser way is don't try, don't try to do an arm wrestling uh, with the earthquake. You'll never win. In an earthquake, the structural skeleton of the building does all the work. The New Zealand engineers concentrated on directing the damage to where the building could safely sustain it. So what we see here is an example of why the structure managed to survive the earthquake. It's a very good design philosophy. We call it capacity design, meaning if we want to make the structure behaving as we wish, we prefer to break in a good protected region and not in the danger region. For example, if we break an ankle, which is the column, the whole buildings can collapse. But if we break an arm and the legs are still standing, then the building will not collapse. In a reinforced concrete structure, steel bars and the surrounding concrete work together to absorb the earthquake's energy in the critical part of the building. All of this is great. So it's absolutely normal then during an earthquake, something has to give and the concrete has to give by breaking, cracking, but that's not a big deal itself because that's what it's meant to do. Imagine the shaking uh, of the earthquake is moving back and forth in all directions, uh, the two directions plus vertical, and this region has done very well. The column is in intact, but the beams has, again, sacrificed themselves, uh, and the beam had to, had to give away. Uh, what we see here is fresh concrete, because a lot of concrete uh, spalled out, got out. 
So without that concrete, the beam is weaker, so you have to go back and replacing a little bit of a strength. It's a stopgap measure to increase safety for the demolition workers tasked with bringing this building down along with hundreds of others in the city. The good news is that the building did exactly what it was meant to be doing, so protecting lives and uh, going through the earthquake without collapse. The bad news is that nowadays we can't afford to demolish a building because it just did what it was meant to do. So the question which everyone is asking, not only in Christchurch but internationally, is can we build a new skeleton, a new technology, which is giving to this structure the capacity to go through an earthquake without being damaged? But for people to go back into a building after a big earthquake, they need to know they're safe. And key infrastructure, such as airports, need solid data to make decisions with. We needed some way of knowing what was happening to our buildings and what was happening on our land. There was a lot of confusion about whether a shake was this or that, or whether it required us to shut the airport. They needed certainty, and New Zealand had already developed the technology to provide it. This accelerograph is designed to monitor ground movements, big and small. The ground motion that would set off a threshold would be an earthquake. So we'll be measuring vehicle traffic, but that won't be causing any level of interest. Whenever a preset threshold is exceeded, an alert is automatically sent out to airport staff. And then they can implement either evacuation or visual inspection or know that the earthquake was not actually big enough to cause a concern and continue operating. Thirteen of these installed around the airport brought clarity to the decision-making table. So it gave us quite a lot of certainty and also a, a lot of trust was established with employees uh, working in buildings and the public to know that we were basing our decisions on hard technical data rather than, mm, gee, that was a bit of a shake and we need to have a look at things. It's the sort of technology you need when you live in a country that sits on a tectonic plate boundary. The Earth is alive with literally thousands of earthquakes every day. But at least once a year, a great earthquake of magnitude 8 or more ruptures somewhere near the fringes of the massive plates that cover the Earth's surface. New Zealand straddles two of them. New Zealand has earthquakes because we've got two plates rubbing up against one another. They form part of the Pacific Rim where 90% of the world's earthquakes occur. It's known as the Ring of Fire. It's a zone maybe 200 kilometres wide, which is where volcanoes and earthquakes happen. That's where large earthquakes have occurred in the past. And of course, it's the large earthquakes that do most of the damage and are likely to do most of the future damage. New Zealand's Alpine Fault offers one of the world's few records of large earthquakes on large faults. Long records, maybe going back several thousand years, aren't obtained from very many places at all. A scientific tool for looking into the future. If we understand its past behaviour, then we can make a better forecast for future activity. Hokuri Creek is right on the Alpine Fault rupture zone and the layers of peat and silt in its banks give clear evidence of its past activity. So these silt layers are essentially the layers that are formed immediately after earthquakes, after the fault has moved and created a bit more space, which had quite a bit of running water. And then the dark layers, peaty layers, these are the quiet water recovery sort of stage of the landscape. So that horizon there is where the earthquake occurred. With all of these layers all around this uh, area here, and there's about 24 uh, pairs of layers, and it goes all the way up to the top of the terrace, and down here about 20 metres, and a little bit below us, below river level, are these alternating sequence of silts and peats, all the way back from about 8,000 years ago to about 1,000 years ago at the top of the section. Scientists know that even the regular ruptures of the Alpine Fault aren't enough to soak up all the strain from the colliding plates. 
The geohazard model of New Zealand already indicated a floating fault capable of generating a magnitude 7 plus earthquake somewhere in the plains. The Alpine Fault takes up about 70% of that total motion between the Pacific and the Australian plates. But that remaining 30% that has to get taken up somewhere gets taken up by a whole series of faults both in the Southern Alps and beneath the Canterbury Plains. And it was one of those faults that ruptured in the Darfield earthquake sequence. Before September the 4th, 2010, the Greendale Fault was hidden deep beneath the gravels of the Canterbury Plains. It's quite amazing when you think of the amount of energy that was radiated from that earthquake that it looks so subtle in the landscape. We've excavated this trench into the fault to try and understand the earthquake history. So we're about three meters below the surface here. And we followed the Greendale Fault down through the gravel sequence into some sandy channels that are older than the deposits that overlie them. What that tells us is that we think, in this particular instance, we're seeing gravels that have just been displaced by two earthquakes. There's been the Darfield earthquake in September, which has broken it, but then another earthquake, a very similar magnitude to the Darfield earthquake that occurred five, 10, maybe 15,000 years ago. So it's a long time between earthquakes here on the Greendale Fault, which is good news for the people of Canterbury. This fault, because it's had its one in a 5,000, one in a 10,000 year earthquake on it, going forward, this, this fault does not pose a significant seismic hazard to Christchurch. And at the moment, we're sort of saying, this fault has such a long recurrence interval that uh, in terms of housing, it's not really terribly relevant some people have actually built their, their house 10 meters away from where the fault went through their front door and out their back door. The Canterbury Plains. They're New Zealand's largest area of flat land. It's a young landscape, a floodplain, built layer upon layer from the eroding Southern Alps. As you look out over my shoulder towards Christchurch, much of that landscape that you see now was beneath the ocean as little as 6,000 years ago, which in geological terms is like the blink of an eye. As those rivers brought sediment from the Southern Alps into this alluvial plain, it pushed the ocean back and back further to the east. And what it left behind was a landscape of a variety of different types of geologic materials. There are river sands and bits of gravel from the rivers that meandered their way across the landscape. There are silts, fine-grained material, that um, resulted from the, the rivers overtopping their banks and depositing fines around the edges. The early town planners built much of the eastern side of the city of Christchurch on these fine-grained sediments, once swamps and riverbanks. Unbeknownst to them, that water so close to the surface meant the land was vulnerable in an earthquake as the people of Christchurch found out when floods of water gushed from the ground. Oh my God. Leaving behind a dull grey sludge. Everyone in New Zealand learnt a new word, liquefaction. Certainly liquefaction is probably one of the most profound aspects of the Christchurch earthquakes. Liquefaction is a process whereby some types of soils start to behave more like a liquid than a solid. The soil loses its structure under pressure and erupts to the surface through the topsoil. There's three key factors which affect the likelihood of liquefaction actually occurring. The first is that the soil has to be loose enough so that when it's subjected to ground shaking, it wants to become denser. The second factor is that the soil actually has to be saturated, so below the water table. And then the third factor is that the soil has to be shaken strongly in order for that contraction to occur. So we have loose soil, below the water table and also strong ground shaking. And what we've got here is our soil up to this point which is representing the ground surface. You can see that the water level is just below the ground surface which is similar to what it's like in Christchurch. So you can see this shake table starting to move now but the movement's very small. So this is representing small levels of ground shaking which might occur from a small earthquake. Now the shaking's starting to build up in amplitude and this is slowly building up this water pressure inside the soil. So as this build-up occurs, we expect to see the house start to settle and the manhole start to uplift. <laughs> 
This liquefaction process forced over 300,000 tons of silt out of the ground, damaging streets and leaving property buried in thick layers. Thousands of homes were damaged, and some suburbs will never be reoccupied. The liquefaction damage may be the greatest ever recorded anywhere in a modern city. It's a hazardous side effect of any sizable earthquake, but it's not the most dangerous one. The Canterbury earthquakes, the first deadly earthquakes in New Zealand in recent memory, are a shocking reminder that our planet is very much alive, its surface a jigsaw of moving plates. Let's just say that the centre of the Earth is hot and fluid, extremely hot, and above that is more rock mass, which can move and circulate uh, above this uh, incredible energy source in the centre of the Earth. Plates themselves, in terms of plate tectonics, are just sitting on the top and floating on this circulating mass of hot, plasticky sort of rock. What happens on the big faults where the plates meet varies depending on what sort of rock is on either side of the fault. The Alpine Fault in the Southern Alps of New Zealand is a classic case of continental collision. That's where um, continental rocks on each side of the fault are under, in collision, they're being pressed, compressed together, and the Alpine Fault is a, a, is a dipping fracture in the earth that, that will rupture and one rock mass will be thrust over the top of the other. That's a, that's a continental collision scenario, very much like the Himalaya, the Alpine orogenies in Europe. Subduction zones, on the other hand, are places where cold, dense, oceanic rocks are subduct beneath the continental mass. Which is exactly what's happening where the Australian plate boundary twists off to the east of New Zealand. In New Zealand, our Hikarangi subduction zone is about 600 kilometres in length from Kaikoura to East Cape. But actually, the subduction zone extends further north up into the Kermitic area. When the Pacific Plate starts to dive down underneath the North Island, it's dipping very gently, only a few degrees um, of, of gradient on, the, on the, 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 the fault itself. But it starts to plunge down steeper as you go towards the west, so that it's up to several hundred kilometres deep beneath the ground surface beneath the western part of the North Island. It's that depth combined with their length that means subduction zones can generate the largest earthquakes on Earth, with the added danger of causing large tsunami. Large tsunami are generated by the subduction fault moving very large areas of the ocean floor quite suddenly. So if we were to uplift hundreds of square kilometres of ocean floor by a metre, we're going to displace an awful lot of water, which is going to propagate away from that zone, away from the coast and towards the coast. New Zealand's subduction zone is a similar fault to the one that triggered the magnitude 9.1 earthquake off the coast of Japan. The seventh most powerful in history, it released the energy equivalent of over 70,000 Hiroshima bombs. It ruptured a subduction zone east of Japan and the extent of the fault that broke was something like five to six hundred kilometres in length. Being of similar length, New Zealand's subduction zone could generate a similar event. We really need to be prepared for magnitude eight earthquakes to be occurring on the subduction zone, and it's very likely that some of those will also generate tsunami. In 1855, a six-metre tsunami swept across the area near Wellington's airport and into the harbour. And the same thing could happen today. But it's not the only hazard Wellington faces. It sits on a long fault of its own, carrying a big load. So the plates are moving in Wellington about four centimetres a year. <laughs> that doesn't sound like much, but over 500 years, that's a cricket pitch, wicket to wicket. All of Wellington has to absorb that, and that happens during earthquakes. The sort of earthquakes that occur along the Wellington Fault. And that has a length that can produce a magnitude seven and a half earthquake. It runs through the Wellington city, on up past the motorway, cuts several times, five times the main water supply to Wellington, so it poses a significant risk. But this risk is nothing new. And just as the lessons from Christchurch will spread through the world, 
New Zealand has already benefited from tragic earthquakes in other countries. We have the late 80s, the San Francisco Loma Prieta earthquake, the Kobe earthquake, big overpasses collapsed. So there was a big retrofit program for the Thorndon Overbridge. That overbridge is the main transportation route in and out of Wellington, a crucial lifeline in a disaster. Now, the Wellington Fault actually crosses under the roadway. And fortunately, the columns were built to a code that was shown to be deficient. New Zealand engineers came up with several innovative solutions. They put some big steel jackets around the columns to add extra support for the columns. A number of the columns are on liquefiable soil. And they've increased the liquefaction resilience, tied the columns back to each other, put deeper piles in. Now, at the top of the columns, the roadway is sitting on a seat. Now, before the retrofit, the seat was rather small, so it didn't take much movement for the roadway to drop. So the original construction wasn't likely to handle the intense shaking expected right on the rupture zone. And what they've done is put the steel catchers at the top of the columns, and that's so when the fault moves, the roadway will be caught and stay at the same level, and that'll help reoccupy this bridge after the event. Other breakthrough seismic solutions out of New Zealand targeted building technology, and Te Papa is a famous example of one of them, base isolation. Base isolating is actually keeping the building isolated from the ground. Because what happens in an earthquake, you get this great big hammer blow, um, like a sledgehammer blow, and the ground moves. And if your building is rigidly fixed to it, the building moves as well. But if you can isolate it, what happens is the inertia of the building just keeps it there while the ground goes bang, like that. And so it doesn't take the shock that the ground is trying to put into it. But if you can base isolate it, you can actually take out as much as 80% of the shock. It's what the ancient Greeks were doing when they built some of their temples on gravels and animal skins. But it was a New Zealand scientist, Bill Robinson, who heralded in the modern era of base isolation. What he came up with was the idea of having this big block of rubber, drilling a hole through the middle and putting a lead core in it so that when it um, displaced, the energy was absorbed by the lead and it actually sort of turned plastic and um, it could deform and absorb energy. And they allow the building to float um, with, with semi-contact with the ground. Built for New Zealand's Ministry of Health in 1982, this was the first building in the world to use this technology. It's a technology widely accepted in California and Japan. In Japan, tenants will pay 10% more to live in a base isolated building. Yet only 10 buildings in New Zealand have been base isolated, and only one in Christchurch. That is the only building in the South Island that's been designed and built with base isolation. And that building stayed open and functional through all the earthquakes that we've had. And, you know, you go across the river, and there's, they'll be lucky if 10% of the buildings in town will be left standing. Everyone thinks it's expensive, but it's not. You can actually design a base isolated building 5 to 10% cheaper than a conventional building. Whereas base isolation allows the ground to move beneath the building, Another cutting-edge New Zealand technology allows the building to move with the earthquake and then return to its original shape. If we think about two boxers punching each other, the worst way to get a punch is just to go straight into the punch. The best way is to use the dynamics of that and basically moving as much as possible together with the punch. The technology was extensively tested at the University of Canterbury before the earthquakes began. This building went through months of testing, subjecting the building through many, many earthquakes of the type of February, if not even stronger, and we couldn't break it. It's a design based on flexibility. 
by combining together elements, uh, prefabricated blocks, uh, and tying uh, a big, high-strength uh, steel. Under pressure, steel behaves like elastic. It's uh, like a rubber band, tying them strongly to make them working one against each other. Then you have a very, very strong system, but it's not strong and brittle. Should the earthquake be uh, bigger than what you've been tying your elements one against each other for, then you're simply going to go for the ride. And the ride looks uh, the Greek temple rocking motion. Back and forth, back and forth, you can't break it. The other component is a sort of fuse, so that if the building's overloaded, it breaks where it's meant to. The additional feature to make really capacity design the next generation of system is uh, the possibility of using a fuse. You see, it's basically weaker over here, so we want to be sure that we know exactly where the fuse is going to break, like an electrical fuse. And under the earthquake, these elements, which we call a plug and play, because it's easy to put in and put out, is going to stretch back and forth. The steel is going to act as plastic material. Basically, the critical famous fuse is going to be over here. And if we do it properly under the earthquake, this fuse is going to absorb all the energy and sacrifice itself under many aftershocks. So you might want to take it, replace it, and then change it maybe with a stronger fuse. This is what the new building technology can actually provide, a solution which is capable of replacing the damaged element in a cost-effective manner. And the end user, which are basically the tenants, the building owners, people living in houses, should be asking, tell me more about these shock absorbers. The more they're going to ask for it, the more the price is going to go down. New Zealand is renowned for innovative seismic technology and design. This, combined with the lessons learned from the tragic events of February 22, 2011, could work to increase everyone's safety when the next earthquake inevitably strikes. No one can ignore the risk of living on a plate boundary, but the combination of a modern city, an unusually destructive earthquake, and a strong tradition of seismic engineering has produced potentially life-saving information. For one of the first times in New Zealand, at least, we have an extremely good data set where we, we can really understand right from the earthquake source all the way through to the consequences in terms of many different metrics to society. So, for instance, we can define what sort of ground accelerations are required to trigger rock falls, to cause rocks to break apart in situ, in place, to cause liquefaction in some areas but not in others. Uh, and it is going to lead to decades of world-leading research. This research feeds into the global knowledge gained from other destructive earthquakes, lessons learned from tragedy that change policy such as building codes in order to improve people's safety. But changing the policy doesn't necessarily change the building. The building that failed in Christchurch, costing the most lives, was built using a structural system in common use in the 70s and 80s until it was proven unsafe in the California and Kobe earthquakes in the mid-90s. Now, both of these earthquakes were similar to the Christchurch earthquake in terms of shaking, and what we observed in these earthquakes is this type of construction doesn't perform well under earthquakes. And that was enough to cause us to change the regulations in the design code for New Zealand buildings. But when the code changes, most owners are only legally obliged to bring their buildings up to over 33%. That's one third of the code. So the buildings remain vulnerable in the event of a big earthquake. 34% of the building code is not easy to determine, but for me personally, I would be unhappy to have um, anybody that I know working in a building less than two thirds of the building code. There is no magic figure though, and I think um, from Christchurch we learned that there were buildings that did collapse, CTV and Pangal Guinness, that, were, that would not have been described as earthquake prone. So it does mean that we've got to be careful and, and assess buildings, particularly um, the CTV building was built in 1986, so it would be assumed to be safer than perhaps it was. Christchurch was obviously a harsh lesson in this case, so really that requires us to re-examine these buildings and decide how vulnerable they are and potentially require that they be retrofitted.
The construction plans for hundreds of buildings are under review. They've done what's called an IEP, um, an initial look at the building from the plans to see whether they're at risk, and then they've assessed whether they're earthquake prone from more detailed structural assessments in some instances. Seismologists living in New Zealand are aware that the next earthquake is only a matter of time. Earthquakes happen in a great big smudge that occurs right down the east coast of the North Island, right th down to Fiordland. So big earthquakes can be generated anywhere through that smudge zone, and we have to be prepared for those. And I think what Christchurch taught us is that a significant earthquake can go wham, hit you, and there's not much you can do about it at the time. Everybody knows that we live on an active plate boundary. Um, it's why New Zealand's beautiful. Um, but you know, we know that there are risks, earthquake hazards, landslides, volcanoes, tsunami. For me personally, I would say that you should not be worried. You should be aware. You, we need to have knowledge. We need to be prepared. And in the event of a tsunami, being prepared means not wasting any time. If you feel um, an earthquake that is shaking uh, very strongly for 20 seconds or more, very strongly meaning it's hard to stand up, that is an earthquake that is potentially very near. Uh, and in Wellington particular, anywhere along the east coast of the North Island, that means you have to get out. You don't wait for anybody to tell you to get out. You don't turn on your radio. You've got about 10 minutes to get away from the coast and up high. The inevitability of earthquakes should also influence where we choose to build. Moderate-sized earthquakes, like Christchurch, can occur anywhere including directly on previously unknown faults right beneath urban centres. At some level, there's not a lot we can do about those earthquakes happening, but there are decisions that we can make in our built-up environments to make us more resilient to those earthquakes should they occur. Having appropriate setback distances from major cliff faces, for instance. Setting aside areas that are vulnerable to liquefaction, perhaps creating corridors for parks and things like that, as opposed to, to building houses on those areas. And some building technologies are far more likely to survive earthquakes than others. We can't, by definition, change the frequency of earthquakes. We are, do, not, do not have that toolkit as yet as a human being. But what we can do is to minimize as much as possible the vulnerability of the built environment where we're living in. We are being engaged by the international community, and when I say community, it's not only the scientific community, it's the policy-making people, it's the high-level governance. Think about how could we learn from the lessons that we have been facing in Christchurch. We can't afford taking down completely a full city. Can we in the future have a damage-free building? We are getting there. The good news is that we have technology that can go through an earthquake, huh? Basically, after the earthquake, we are going to stay in, the, uh, in our desk, being shaken, but continue the work, the work as usual, and hopefully enjoy the buildings again for another few decades. It is possible in the third millennium to construct buildings in that way.